Thank you, Mr. Hale. Thank you, Atlanta, Atlanta History Center. I've been here before. I'm glad to be back. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be back uh, talking about something that's been a subject that's been dear to me for my whole life, and it's inescapable now that I'm getting older that it is my life's work, uh, and I'm glad for it. Um, this is another round. Um, I'm going to take more questions tonight than I normally do. I'm going to try to say some provocative things about why I think this history is significant uh, and about this project itself, which is a little odd to spend 24 years writing a 2,300-page trilogy and then come out a few years later with a 190-page book. Uh, a lot of people who have read some of the other ones think that it's probably not true that I'm cap somebody else wrote it, that I'm not capable of writing <laughs> something this, this brief. Uh, I assure you that I did. Um, and uh, there is blood on the floor of my office because it involved eliminating or at least setting aside 95% of what I worked so hard uh, to produce in the interest of finding the most salient parts in the uh, original language uh, and 18 moments that I thought could reintroduce in a more compact form the major elements, losing large numbers of characters that are dear to me, and I don't, um, I will deny, I'm still curious myself as to what people who have read the whole trilogy. I get notes all the time from people who say they read the whole trilogy every year, and I'm very grateful for that. That's, that's an amazing thing. Most books are out of the bookstores in six months or less. Uh, these are still around after 20-something years. But, this is the digital age, and there are millions of Americans who won't pick up a story, even a storytelling book that involves people personally if it's more than 800 pages long, um, which, which my books are. So m when my publisher came to me with the challenge to try to have a compact version that would involve making the selections, number one, which was hard enough, but then writing new material to summarize what was left out and drop you into each story in a sense that would give people a sense of the full sweep of an extraordinary transformational era. I accepted it for two reasons, the challenge. Number one, teachers over the years have complained to me that their students relate to storytelling, particularly in trying to understand race relations that most of what passes for a discussion of race relations in the United States is argument, and argument is people just making themselves feel good while pretending to discover something, uh, and uh, taking some sort of morally unassailable point of view and defending it with new labels and new words. Um, and we are trained in the West to think that analytical words command detail. But largely in race relations, it's fool's gold, and the way we learn is when things are really personal. Teachers said that their students related to the personal stories in my books, but that they couldn't assign an 800-page book to a high school student, and even a lot of college students. And quite frankly, two years ago, uh, I went for a foundation in New York called the Gilder Lerman Institute, which makes teaching aids available to teachers to teach American history, they sent me to Idaho, of all places, to talk to high school history teachers about the challenges of teaching American history, and particularly civil rights history. Um, and I don't know how many of you have gone to Idaho, but I went very reluctantly because there are basically no black people in Idaho, and I didn't know that anybody would be interested in it. And uh, I was thrilled on the one hand that they were intensely interested. And they said something that's really obvious, which is something that I always say. They already knew it. They said, this is not just race relations. This is about fairness. This is about citizenship. This is about stuff that is really broad. We want to be able to teach this material. But here's the way it is, Taylor. On Sunday nights in Idaho, I'm cooking dinner for my kids. And with one hand, I'm Googling the internet in a desperate hope that I can find something 
that has enough storytelling in it that I can present it to my kids in the three or four days we get to try to communicate the civil rights movement. Our textbooks are oatmeal. They are arguments with dates all in them, uh, deliberately trying to make this history inaccessible. Have I lost my mic? No. I didn't do anything. <laughs> the Gilder Lerman Institute may not be popular here, but it's a very good organization. <laughs> I don't think that it deserves, okay, so we've apologized to them. Anyway, these history teachers in Idaho said, what you don't realize is that we are on the low end of the totem pole if you're a history teacher. Schools in the United States are now evaluated by test scores for students in English and in math, not in history. If you're a good history teacher, your principal, for a good reason, is suggesting that you might do well to teach English uh, because the school is not evaluated on history. Without a sense of American history, it's impossible to teach citizenship, which has also been wiped out uh, of, of our curric curriculum. So they say, our schools are not built to teach history. If it's the essence of citizenship, we're not training citizens. If we really believe that citizens are responsible for their own government, we're imperiling our own republic. We are at the low end of the budget scale if you're in the history department of a public high school in Idaho because most of the budgetary priority goes to the, to the other subjects. And our textbooks aren't very good to begin with. Please do something because as much as we love the storytelling in your American the King Ears trilogy, we can't assign it to our kids. And most of our kids are getting their materials now on iPads and uh, that sort of thing anyhow. And if there were material that were put in a form that we could use, we could bypass the whole textbook business and we could engage our students and we could have a great leap forward. So I met a lot of these teachers and it, and it really, and it, it occurred to me that they've been telling me this same thing for years. Storytelling is critical in race, but it has to be done in a way that is palatable to these students. And the last thing in the world we can do is blame the students for not learning the history that does not come through their umbilical cord. If we don't teach it to them, then we can't blame them for not learning it. And uh, if I believe, as I do, and I'm going to explain very briefly why I believe that a sense of American history is not easy to get but vital to have, then it's worth every bit of effort we can make to try to make it easy for the teachers who are our primary conduits for this bit of how did our republic get here and how are we going to preserve and improve it. So one was teachers. That made me accept this challenge from my publisher. The other was a growing sense of frustration, and I'll just give you a few sentences of this and then start and then take questions. Frustration that we are fundamentally out of balance in our historical understanding of the last 50 years. That our unconscious determines what we are receptive to to a degree that is much greater than we realize and has blocked a real appreciation for the challenge, the privilege, the uplift, the potential, the intellectual content of this era has been pigeonholed in so many respects to make it uh, uh, less meaningful in our everyday lives across the lines that divide us than it should be. So I thought what really got me with the publishers was the idea of condensing the 2,300 pages into less than 200 gives me the opportunity to pick the things that I think are the most salient from the full sweep of the civil rights era, which I define as 54 to 68, uh, the peak years from the Brown decision to the death of Dr. King. Uh, it, just as a matter of coincidence, 54 is the year Dr. King took his first church. Uh, so he started his career exactly at a short career. He was only 39 when he was killed. And his short career exactly matches those uh, 14 years. 
that if I could find 18 moments that I thought communicated the full sweep, that it would serve not only as an introduction to a new generation of young people in the digital age and possibly